So thank you for coming. Um, so this is a topic that I'm going to share with you that I've been working a lot with and I'm passionate about. So my name is Paul. Uh, I work for Seagal. Um, I used to work 10 years for Microsoft as a consultant. So I've been seeing a lot of cloud solutions that are not protected well enough and been called out for a lot of emergency rescues in different companies uh, in Europe. So uh, really happy to be sharing the experiences uh, with you guys. Um, so yeah, that's me. So anyone here knows the name Kevin Mitnick? Yeah? So what did he do? He hacked a lot of government systems, right? So uh, he hacked the FBI, he hacked into some software vendors, stole their software and uh, shared it with people. And he was one of the most famous hackers in the 80s and 90s. And uh, he was on the run from the US government for two and a half years. Uh, in the end, they arrested him and yeah, he spent like five years in jail uh, for what he did. So what was the impact of what he does, uh, what he did? So was it harmless fun? Maybe. He stole software. And the impact that that had on other people wasn't that great. It wasn't a big impact. So what impact can cybersecurity have on us, on the companies that we work for? So basically, there's three things that can happen. So information is leaked. You can have loss of data or service outages. So that's the impact that it can have. But really, what's behind that? What's, what's the real impact? So anyone heard about Maersk uh, shipping company? Yeah. They basically run 18% of the container trade in the world. So in 2017, I was called out to a mission. So they'd been hit by a ransomware attack. They run 19 ports all over the world. And their systems were encrypted. They were not able to get the systems up and running. And they were uh, hit by a ransom. Uh, and people wanted them to pay to get the data uh, out again. They didn't want to pay. So we were called out. Luckily, they had backup of all of their data. But it took two weeks to recover everything. And at that time, those two weeks, uh, so what they said was that none of those 18% of cargo by ship in the world, they didn't know where the containers were, what, uh, what things they had all over the world, 18% of the cargo trade by ship, didn't know where it was. And they were not able for two weeks to get any containers into port. That's a serious impact. So their business was halted for two weeks. Oh, sorry. So uh, $300 million was the direct hit on their business. Plus uh, lack of reputation. However, they were really open about this. So they opened up and said, we've been hit by a ransomware attack. It will take us time. And they regained some of the trust. Because if it's something that you want to do, it's, it's business with a company that knows that they've been attacked and taken the measures to recover things and to make security stronger. If you have companies that doesn't know they're under attack, they're probably under attack anyway. Others. Uh, serious attacks. Uh, Florida water supply was hit by an attack that increased the lie levels to dangerous levels in their water supply. That could, could have killed people. Uh, Microsoft Exchange 
was hit by an attack where 30,000 organizations worldwide were exposed their emails for their users. 30,000 organizations, not people. And there's just a multitude of ransomware attacks all over the world. And most of them you don't hear about because they choose to pay the ransom. So it's cheaper. Uh, Maersk wasn't really the aim of the attack. So probably they would have gotten away with a lot less than $300 million. But they chose not to. And then we go to healthcare. So every year, sensitive data for thousands of patients, maybe millions of patients, are exposed through the internet. And that's serious. In Germany, there was a ransom attack uh, to an uh, emergency uh, department. And one woman died because she was reverted to another hospital. And she died in the transfer. Um, in Alabama, in the US, uh, a baby died because uh, of a ransomware attack, because they didn't have the systems available to do the tests that they needed to do. And most systems for healthcare isn't yet in the cloud, but it's getting there, right? So you need to protect them. So it is a matter of life and death. There are big losses. People are getting threatened. And there's mental health issues connected to this as well. So a family in, in India was hit by both uh, people stealing their money and also getting pictures and um, changing them, modifying the pictures into sexualized pictures of the family. And the parents, in the end, chose to take the lives of the whole family of four. So it, it is a life and death thing. And then I have a customer story. So I worked for or got into uh, work for a company uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a building management company. And you wouldn't think that's too serious. But they, sh they manage public buildings. So what they do is, is uh, they manage all the embassies all over the world for their country. What they did was to put an intermediate storage in the cloud where they exposed an API to be able to share data between their application. And it was all secured in the API management through token, Azure AD, uh, you wouldn't be able to get into the API management without uh, going through, uh, through Azure AD and get a proper token. The thing was that the background APIs and the databases wasn't secured at all. So any attacker could come into their systems. So uh, there was a threat uh, against one of the employees because this was uh, exposed on the internet and that had serious consequences so it was openly available not secured at all sensitive information about employees so this is their architecture so the api management services is well protected you need to have a token to get in there and any attacker that uh, tries to get in will be blocked. So far, so good. What, what about these? They're not protected at all, not even a key. So if you know where to go, you'll get all the information you need. And to many attackers, this is a game, right? They, uh, if you expose it to the standard service URLs, azurewebsites.com, you can just uh, brute force and, and try to find URLs. And in the end, you'll get something that's unsecured. There's a lot of them. And then there's professional hackers. They know even more about getting into those systems. And you have government organizations. So if some uh, other country that uh, wants to harm your country get into those systems, then uh, they can do whatever they want.
So what to do about it? Whose responsibility is it? So it, it's our responsibility as developers. So if you see a system that is not secured, then you should talk about it. You should tell them. You need to secure this, right? It's not the responsibility of the security people, the networking people. It's not them creating the applications and uh, exposing them. So like 10 years ago, people made non-critical systems in the cloud. Now people are getting more critical and sensitive systems in the cloud. And we're creating them, right? We're exposing the data. So we need to make sure that everything that we create is properly secured. So, one of the things that you can do is go to the DR. No, <laughs> that would be a good idea. So DR in this case is disaster recovery, right? We all know that. So what is disaster recovery? So you have the backup and you need to test the restore, right? You test your uh, disaster recovery strategy. You test the full recovery. Like Mask did have backup, they didn't properly test the restore, but it did work in the end. It took 10 days, but they got back. So you need to test the full recovery and you need to know what's your recovery point. So how often do you do the backups that make you go back to that state, right? Is it every minute? Is it every second? Is it every day, right? Can you accept to lose a day's worth of work and data? Or can't you? Do you need it to be within the minute, within the second? Then you have to cater for that. That's in your disaster recovery strategy. And also your recovery time. So how much time will it take to recover? Mask took 10 days. Is that too long? Yeah, probably. It cost them $300 million. If they could do it in a day, it would be much less, right? You will have one day stop and then you could take the cargo into port again. So it does matter the recovery time. And then one non-technical part of disaster recovery is also to do a business impact review. So how much do we think it will cost us that this system is down? So and do that for all of the systems, right? So some systems are not critical, okay? Then we don't need to care that much about recovery for that system. We can live with them without them for a week, for two weeks, but some systems we need up to date. So we need to, uh, to have an impact review of all the systems. So what can we do to protect the systems? So a simple key. So that was the first thing I did when I came into that uh, company with the building management. It's like, yeah, just implement the key. In Azure, probably in Google as well, you have that built in. You can just click it, create the key, you give the key to the, uh, to the client developers, and then you're done. That's first point of security. It, it, it's not the best security, but it prevents some people from getting in, right? And the longer the key you have, the more time it will take to brute force an attack. So if you have a 20 uh, characters long key, it will take years to do a brute force attack. And of course, one thing that you need to do is to enforce encrypted traffic. So HTTPS, TLS, uh, otherwise the keys will be uh, intercepted and, or if the traffic is intercepted, the key will be read even if it's in the header or if it's in the URL, doesn't matter. They will be able to read it and then they can attack you. And then you have to be uh, aware of that keys, of course, is something that you share with someone. So how do you share it? If you share it to multiple people, every single one of them is responsible for not sharing it to other people. So how do you keep a secret? <laughs> That's the best way to keep a secret. So you won't get the good people into your systems either. So where should we not keep any secrets? So anyone? Sorry? 
Repository, very good. Yeah. Repository is the worst place to keep the secret. Yeah. Yeah, we keep it in the key vaults, but repository, why is it a really, really bad idea? It, yeah, it will be there forever. Yeah. So only way to, uh, to prevent that is to change the key, right? So the key that is stored in the repository will be there forever. So, and uh, yeah, um, and you should not keep it in config. If you can avoid having uh, secrets in config, then you should, yeah, use key vaults. That's uh, the best way. You should not keep it in deploy scripts either, right? So many people do that. They put the keys in the deploy script. Yeah, everywhere. Um, and it shouldn't be uh, visible in deploy runs. Even if you use key vaults, if you don't secure them in the deploy runs, they'll show. So uh, yeah, keeping it in key vaults, using managed identities, and uh, doing key vault references in the applications is definitely the best way. It ensures that only the application can access the key, no people can access it, right? And uh, you won't have the key in the config because it will only be a reference to the key. So you can do nothing with the reference because the managed identity of the application is the only one that can access it. And if you need to share passwords, don't send it through files, emails, teams. <laughs> yeah. There are systems for that. So uh, some companies that I work for have like key repositories. And, yeah. And then you, uh, you give the credentials to, or uh, you give access to the person that needs to uh, pick up the secret and you store the uh, secret in the system. So there's a, a lot of ways you can keep it, but key walls and, and uh, secret sharing systems is, is uh, def definitely the best ways uh, to do that. So, but uh, going forward from the key, uh, then you next level, you have mutual authentication. So that's uh, another word for certificate authentication. So you have a server certificate and the client certificate and you share uh, the client certificate, and then uh, there will be a handshake between those two systems, um, and it will uh, allow the traffic. So, but the same as keys, the certificates can be shared. So you can have the certificate in multiple places, and then uh, that will, uh, more people will be able to, uh, to uh, access the application, but it's, it's more cumbersome to sharing the files, installing the certificates, than it's just using a key in the URL or in the header. IP restrictions. That's, now we're getting into really restricting access to the system, right? Now we're narrowing down the, the attack vector. So if we do a deny all, on IP, like for databases or for the web application. So in this case, we would restrict access to, so we're already secure the API management instance, we agree on that. So now we want to secure the function and the database. And then if you can restrict the function to only accept requests from the API management instance, then you have a pipe through there. So you're on IP security. And the same thing with the database. If you have a firewall on the database, you can uh, restrict on the IP of the function. So um, there, there's one problem with IP restrictions as well, because IPs can be spoofed. So someone can say that I'm using this IP, changing the, the network header and, uh, and say that I'm using this IP. So, there's one 
thing about that. So they will be able to say that they're using the IP, but the response will always go to the proper IP. So they could be able to send data into your system and do a lot of bad things there, but they won't be able to retrieve data from your system. So, sorry? Yeah, you, you, you know that the output, because of your IP restrictions, the output will always go to the correct IP. So there are ways you could use that to your advantage. So if you do an exchange of, uh, of secret first, so you have an attacker that attacks you, but they will not be able to enter any information into your system on the first request. So the only thing that you do is to send back a key that he's going to use to communicate with you, right? So when you retrieve that key, that key goes to the proper IP and the attacker will never get that key. So from the good source, it uh, sends a request, gets a key, sends the proper data into your system. So you prevented the attacker from also getting data into your system. All right? And then there's the security hole of the developer. So what does developers do when they need to debug systems and you have a whitelisting of IPs, right? I need my computer to access the database or access the function. So remote debugging, yeah, I need to open this uh, IP and then, yeah. When you start opening to more uh, IPs, then you start opening holes uh, to the systems as well. So be aware that uh, that could be a case uh, too. So then we're coming to authentication. So into the applications or the APIs, um, there's many types of authentication. The simplest one is the username password, right? We've been doing that for a long, long time. And uh, we've had better systems than that for a long, long time as well. So I never use username and password. First of all, it's a lot of job, right? You need to create a credential store and you need to secure the passwords and you need to do all that stuff yourself. If you use an external identity provider like Google or Microsoft uh, AD, and then they will keep all your information, right? And uh, then the only thing you have to do is to um, set up your system to talk to that uh, identity provider and it will make sure you get a token that you're reverted to uh, log in and then you'll check the token when it comes in. So then you'll be good to go. And then you can also set up user roles if you want to in the system so that you say that only these credentials, like service credentials, only this application is able to access this API. Um, and that gives you an, another level of security. But really there's one way that is better than all of these. So we should do all of these as well. But how about if you can do networking? So the best way to prevent attacks is that there is no way of attacking it. So go to healthcare. A lot of these systems are internal. Sometimes they need some external access, but they're internal, talking to internal systems. They're in the cloud because uh, of scalability, because we don't want to run huge server parks anymore, but they're not external systems. They're all internal communicating with internal systems. So if you can isolate the workloads, then you're good to go. Then no one can attack you. You can't attack what you can't see, right? And you can control the traffic into your systems in a much better way. So you can have all traffic going through gateways, uh, through firewalls and control it. Bad thing is that most cloud providers take 
a huge cost when you want to network isolate your uh, workloads. It's getting better. So uh, I work a lot with Microsoft and it's gotten a lot cheaper to, uh, to isolate your resources uh, into separate networks. And then you have like um, isolation versus integration. Um, at least in um, Microsoft, in Azure, you have uh, one way of integrating networking is to use private endpoints and uh, network integration in the background. And that's basically telling the system that they have an extra network card and you can only communicate through that. And that's within the VNet. But a developer can easily just open up and say that, no, we accept traffic from anywhere. That's not good. It's a cheaper way of doing, uh, doing network integration. And if you don't have people opening up, then, um, then you don't have that problem. But really what you want to do is to do the same thing as we always did on premise, right? We, we want to have the networking team and the security team to control the security. As developers, we don't always like them, but we know that it provides security on the cost of flexibility and all that other stuff that we like. But it's a good thing, uh, at least when we're talking about critical or mission critical workloads. So then we're talking about network isolation, which means that basically we need to have our dedicated workloads, right? We, we have our computers or our VMs that run in the cloud. Uh, we don't share them with anyone. We're able to properly VNet integrate or isolate them so that no one else can get in and the developers cannot open up so only access to the systems is through gateways and networking team uh, handles the gateways and the firewalls. That's how it should be, right? So when we look at the architecture uh, earlier, this is the new architecture with ne network isolation. So then we're running an app service environment. We can run a lot of workloads here, but they're always isolated within the VNet. Um, serverless services, we can't really control the infrastructure of those. Uh, those we need to have private endpoints. So still, developer can open up, but uh, we should also have policies to prevent them from doing that. Uh, all traffic into the system go through an application gateway or an application firewall. So that's the only way to get into the system. So if you have a client, um, he will need to get a token from Azure AD. Uh, he will need to have a, a whitelisting in the firewall. So he gets into the VNet and to the application gateway. Deploy agents need to be in the subnet because if we want deployment directly from, uh, from the cloud, then we need to open up to all the agents that are in that system. Sorry? No, it's not. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not uncommon to do it anyway. So some companies think that as long as we have the possibility of having a restriction, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand IPs or if it's two IPs, but yeah, of course it matters. It means that everyone that has an instance in, uh, in DevOps in Azure can deploy to your system and compromise your securities, uh, no secrets and, and all that. So what happens when we have attackers trying to uh, go into these systems? Of course, they're stopped. So uh, they won't get into them. So they will not be able to access the networks at all. They will not be able to see them. So what additional measures can we take? So now, now it's like we've secured the infrastructure and the systems themselves, but there are a lot of other things that we should be doing, um, like enforcing policies. It, policies is not only naming conventions, right? 
It's uh, what options are we able to choose uh, on an application. So authorization, yeah. Uh, TLS version, do you accept TLS 1 or do you enforce TLS 1.2? So TLS 1.1, 1.0, and 1.1 has been compromised a long time ago. So you should enforce 1.2. And, and in the current company I'm working for, there's no way you can uh, deploy anything that doesn't have TLS 1.2. So that, that's policies in Azure. You won't get it deployed. It, it will fail. Um, second thing we're doing in the same company is implementing reference architectures, right? So imagine you as a developer has, have all these policies that you have to comply to. So just to get an application out in, in the cloud. How much time is it going to take you? Of course, uh, differs based on how many policies. But currently, the, the company that I'm working for, uh, yeah, I can tell you a bit about the company. So it, uh, basically manages the gas pipelines from Norway to Germany. And that gas pipeline is quite important because Russia doesn't deliver gas to Germany anymore. So basically, if Germany wants heat and f uh, warm food and everything, they're, they're depending on that gas pipeline. So there's a big threat and there has been two attacks on gas pipelines. Uh, one from uh, yeah, the Russian one and now one in Finland. So it's high, both physical and IT security at the moment. So yeah, uh, but what do we do? We do reference architectures, right? So if you want to deploy a, an Azure function or a website uh, into the cloud, here's your reference architecture. This script, Bicep script, will comply with all the policies that we have, put it into the cloud. It will have a, a deployment agent for you. Then you can start developing. So it won't take you three weeks to just find out all the policies because you create the Bicep script. API management takes yeah, some hours. Uh, the ASC, 14 hours to deploy. So imagine you want to deploy that uh, and try to comply with all the policies. And if you find out every time after 14 hours that, oh, there was a TLS 1.2 missing. Yeah, try again. So it will take you weeks. So, but if you have the reference architecture complying with all the policies, then you're good. And then limiting access to the systems, right? You mentioned key vaults. You don't have to give access to the key vaults to many people not any people in production if you have the managed identities accessing. So it's only the application that should be accessing the key vaults. Are we done? We're still under attack, right? So there will be people trying to access your systems and trying to do things like DDoS attacks. What should we do about DDoS attacks? So we can use the built-in services that exist Application firewalls, use those, that gives you some protection. It gives you the ability to choose what's good traffic, what's bad traffic, the characteristics of traffic, and then you can send the bad traffic out into the nothing, and then the good traffic goes into your system. It will save you downtime, and it will save you cost. If you're scaling, right? You don't want your system to be scaling for a DDoS attack. In, Definitely, that will cost you. Um, and use the rate limiting functionality that you have. And then you should monitor your systems. So I work for a company, they know that they have uh, 3,000 attacks per day. But they know, right? That's the best thing. They know that they have attacks. So they probably have more than 3,000, but at least they know and stop those 3,000 attacks. So they keep a lot of secrets about ships. So we already know that there are ships being built places in Asia uh, that are from stolen drawings. 
so keeping that information is important and we don't want those 3,000 tags to go into our systems. There are a lot of built-in tools to monitor applications and it gives you knowledge into your apps. Um, I worked for one shipbuilding company that had really innovative ship technology and was called to an emergency. And what they discovered was that their uh, SQL database, the server did, was going out of disk space. Going out of disk space. Yeah. That was not because the databases were growing, because they were still small. But the disks were filling up with data that an attacker was collecting to send out. So they, they didn't have any idea that they were under attack. Only thing that notified them about the attack was the disk space of the database server going full. So that, that's what happens when you lack monitoring. Luckily, they had the systems divided into three, which is also uh, a good practice. So without all three uh, parts of the system, they couldn't do anything. And then uh, the cloud renders use machine learning uh, technologies to detect uh, bad traffic as well. So use those uh, systems. Uh, yeah. Outsiders, because uh, I'm normal behavior for, for your application. If you know uh, what's the behavior of your application monitoring, you can see, uh, for example, in, in that case, the right written right per seconds will be a good indicator that someone are uh, is injecting or or stealing data from your device, for example. Yeah. And, and it, it's the same, uh, same technology that you use for fraud detection, right? So abnormalities, detect abnormalities. So when things are not normal, you want to know about it and you want to make, uh, make your measures. Uh, so you want to do alerts, right? That's the last thing. When something is critical, you want alerts and you want to to be told when something important is happening in your systems. So you could build dashboards that have alerts and, uh, and the critical information. But if something is really, really critical and important, you want to have a direct notification, right? You want to have an email, you want to, yeah, SMS. You want to be notified in a way that no other things in your systems do, right? So you have to, have not too little, but not too much. So if all the systems, all minor things give you an, a direct alert, then in the end, you will not see the important one. Well, some material about starting securing of your applications in the, in the cloud, right? Yeah, right. Um, so Microsoft uh, does the cloud adoption framework. So that's a framework with lots of documentation um, and a lot of uh, bicep scripts. Uh, they have the landing zones and then landing zone accelerators for most of their services. So landing zone is uh, kind of a, a concept of uh, building a secure infrastructure, but also with like management groups and how you set up structure for managing subscriptions, all that stuff. And then you create like application landing zones. Uh, and there you have in the, the uh, cloud adoption framework, you have uh, landing zone accelerators for if you want to do web apps, if you want to do databases and, and also like more complex structures with like databases, APIs, uh, web apps, uh, things like that. So that, that, that's a good starting point. I know Google and Amazon also have landing zone concepts. Yeah. So Microsoft actually have two different ones. They have also Velac architected framework, which is more like an yeah, architecture thing. Uh, 
and then the cloud, cloud adoption framework is more infrastructure in how you build things and, and more examples. So well architected is more documentation and, and information about how, how to build a good architecture in the cloud. Yeah. So both, um, yeah, so, so uh, the question was uh, uh, talking about reference architectures, is it for my company or is it uh, uh, a public, uh, publicly available architecture that, uh, that I can adopt for my company? Uh, and it, it's both. Uh, so cloud adoption framework provides you with one version, but uh, like we have the, the policies, so if you want to comply with all the policies of your company, it might not be enough uh, with the reference architecture from Microsoft. So then you create your own. Uh, that's what we're doing. So we're creating our own reference architecture and that, that ensures that when the developer takes our script and deploy our uh, architecture to the cloud, it will already comply with all the, the, uh, the policies that we have. If the cloud is going to be uh, uh, default for the mission critical applications, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> now that that that's what I'm work with, working with every day. So of course I'm happy I, to have uh, work. But yeah, a lot of things like healthcare, uh, having like medical equipment connected to the cloud. It's not necessarily a good idea, right? So there are a lot of workloads that probably should stay on premise. But I think cost and flexibility is going to prevent people from keep it, keeping it on premise and putting it up in the cloud. I think we have to be critical to, uh, to what systems we put up in the cloud as well. So cloud is not necessarily cheaper, right? And it is more difficult to secure. So if you have a good data center, then maybe that's where you should put your mission critical workloads. But then again, when you have to renew the, the machine park, you have to buy new computers. Your management might not want to do that. They, they're like, we've been to the Gartner conference. It should be all cloud now. And you should do AI as well, right? So uh, it's all going to be where the money goes. And I'm afraid that they're not going to buy a new, uh, new computers. They're going to go with the cloud. So. Yeah. Good. Thanks, guys, for coming. Yeah, last question. Okay, yeah. About HP provider, which one do you recommend? Mm -hmm. Uh, choose one that fits with the systems you have, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, but seriously, if all your applications are Google and uh, that's, yeah. So, so don't change to something else just because that might have some other features or some people say that is better. Microsoft did a genius move uh, a few years back, and that's when they changed from the Exchange server being on-premise to, uh, to be in Office 365. Because Exchange server was hell, right? Backup of mail servers was terrible. It took most uh, big companies, it took them more than 24 hours to do the backup, right? And they had like so many systems, it cost them so many, so much money. So when Microsoft said, yeah, you can move everything up into our cloud, you can just access it, right? You pay per user, it's a no brainer. But what they did at the same time was to connect that to Azure AD. So you sync all your users 
up into Azure AD and you have Office 365. So now it's really easy when you create an application. If you create it in Azure, you have a web application, you just do a checkbox and you have it authenticated against your Azure AD, right? So that was a genius move that Microsoft did. So a lot of people that had Microsoft systems and do Office 365 also do Azure. So, but choose the, the one that fits you uh, the best. Uh, I think uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they're probably, yeah, they're just as good as each other and there are a couple of independent ones as well that are good. So Auth0 is one of them, right? 